using free market principles to save the free market system. In a world of conventional confusion. Uh, there will be time for them to make profits. Uh, now's not that time. Daddy, what do taxes pay for? Oh, why everything. Policemen, trees, sunshine. And let's not forget the folks who just don't feel like working, God bless them. Don't be afraid of your freedom. Prepare to unshackle your mind. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Your professor has arrived. Tom Woods. Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, April 1st, 2014. We're talking about John Rawls today. For good or ill, one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. We're talking to Gary Chartier, who joined us last year for his book, The Conscience of an Anarchist. He's got a new book, Radicalizing Rawls, Global Justice and the Foundations of International Law. Typically, Rawls has been used by social democrats and left liberals in support of a welfare state, redistribution of wealth, etc. But Gary's got a fresh take on this, and of course he's also going to be challenging Rawls, as you can tell from the title, on what seems to be the fairly ad hoc difference between how Rawls treats domestic justice and how he treats global justice. And Gary's going to take all of this, rework it into a sensible, coherent, and even attractive package. Gary Chartier is professor of law and business ethics and associate dean of the Zapara School of Business at La Sierra University. Gary, welcome back to the program. Great to be here, Tom. I wonder if we can start off by having you explain not your thesis about Rawls, but why he's important, why he's somebody to reckon with? Sure. Uh, John Rawls is by far the most influential political philosopher in the post-World War II world, writing in English and maybe writing in any language. Uh, He's uh, educated a tremendous number of other philosophers, and his ideas have proved very fruitful and uh, sources of uh, both insight and controversy uh, across the uh, philosophy and political theory professions. Now, your book on Rawls is trying to try to make the overall Rawlsian presentation both more coherent and more market-friendly. And I, I yeah. want to know, before we get into how you do that, are you doing that because you see some value in Rawls's project and you, you want to bring out an aspect of it, you want to, you want to make it more market-friendly because you see there's, there's much that's attractive in it, or is it because, look, Rawls is here to stay, you have to reckon with him, so we might as well put a market spin on it? I mean, which of these two motivations is your primary one? So... It seems to me that both of those motives are really in play. On the one hand, uh, I find some things about Rawls fruitful and interesting and worth engaging with for their own sake. On the other hand, there are some other aspects of his work that uh, I find pretty infuriating. Nonetheless, as you suggest, he's here to stay. He's been tremendously influential, and we really have to come to terms with that. Now, a lot of my listeners, I think, are reasonably if I may borrow a term, cosmopolitan in their knowledge, right? They know a little bit about this, a little bit about that, and I bet a lot of them have a basic understanding of what Rawls is doing, but surely not everybody. Uh, this, as, as influential as he is, the audience for a book like this, of, of like A Theory of Justice or The Law of Peoples, is still pretty small. So maybe before, again, before we get into your approach... Maybe you might explain to us, what is the Rawlsian project? What's he trying to do? And in brief, how is he doing it? So Rawls is interested in laying out an account of just institutions. And he seeks to do that, it seems to me, by trying to spell out what he takes to be the implications of widespread convictions about justice in contemporary Western liberal societies. Uh, At least in his later work, he seems pretty clearly to want to emphasize that what he's doing is helping us to systematize and think clearly about what he thinks are the existing convictions about justice that we have. And so he does this in 
two stages. He's interested, first of all, in domestic justice. He assumes a world full of states, and so he lays out an account of justice in an individual state. There the idea is that people are engaged in a cooperative venture for mutual advantage, which is creating economic value. Uh, Their cooperation generates a large fraction of that value. It's not uh, the product simply of isolated individual effort, and so we need to come up with some mechanism for ensuring that they're all willing to buy in and support the uh, the end result, and he thinks a way to do that is to um, frame the distribution of the product of that cooperative venture in just ways. Uh, what would count as justice, he thinks, well, uh, whatever would be consistent with the principles that might emerge from deliberation behind what he calls the veil of ignorance. So the veil of ignorance... Uh, ensures that we're all unaware of our respective places in uh, the society. Uh, We deliberate formulating rules that we'd all accept, given that we don't know where in the actual society we'll end up. Uh, Famously, he suggests that uh, what we would end up endorsing would be, on the one hand, a set of basic liberties, uh, and on the other hand, a set of distributional rules, uh, notably the so-called difference principle, which holds that uh, whatever inequalities there are in the distribution of wealth in the society need to be justifiable to the people who turn out worst in the society, not necessarily the very worst, but roughly speaking, the working poor, uh, for them to continue being willing to invest in the society, uh, they need to be convinced that they're getting the best possible deal. Uh, So uh, for all that means, uh, ultimately, embracing a set of welfare state and other policies, though, of course, uh, some other Rawlsians have suggested that that basic principle could lead us in other directions. At the global level, Rawls envisioned something similar, uh, but instead of people deliberating behind the veil of ignorance, we've got representatives of states, or as he prefers, peoples deliberating behind the veils of ignorance, behind the veil of ignorance, uh, crafting rules of international law and international justice, and uh, they are not surprisingly, we get rules that keep the existing state system in place, but impose some limits on it. All right, that's where we're ultimately going to want to take this, but for now... What do you mean by the phrase, the two moral powers that uh, Rawls appeals to? Because I think understanding that helps to understand how you frame your argument. Sure. So in Rawls' first and still best-known book, A Theory of Justice, um, he doesn't so much focus, as he does in the later work, on spelling out uh, the presuppositions of Western liberal political morality. Instead, he sees himself, it seems, uh, as offering a more kind of foundationalist argument about how politics ought to proceed. And so he's got to figure out who participates in this deliberation behind the veil of ignorance. And he suggests that people who have the so-called two moral powers, uh, which have to do roughly with the ability to understand and make sense of and critique moral arguments, that that minimum capacity uh, is what's required for participation uh, in the, uh, the veil of ignorance, and so by, in the debate behind the veil of ignorance. And so everybody uh, with some fairly minimal capacities for reflection and judgment gets included. Now, when we shift from the original position, the veil of ignorance that Rawls is referring to when he's conceiving of domestic justice, how peoples within a society will devise rules that they would find satisfactory. We move from there to global justice in a a world of states, or in in which he just takes for granted that there will be a world of states. Things seem to change. For example, the difference principle either doesn't seem to apply in, in dealing with global justice, or it applies much less robustly. And there are, of course, a lot of other problems that come about when you conceive of these questions solely in terms of states interacting with one another, rather than as individuals who just happen to be within arbitrary political boundaries interacting with one another. This seems to be the heart of the problem. That's absolutely right, Tom. You've stated it very elegantly and very precisely. And what's been fascinating to observe is the degree to which Rawls's approach to international justice, though it's one he actually lays out early on in a theory of justice, uh, it really doesn't get 
sustained attention until the last uh, book that he actually completed as a as an author, uh, a book called The Law of Peoples. It's it's just been fascinating to see how that approach has led to a uh, really quite vigorous debate among people who embrace the broad Rawlsian program. So some people have rushed to defend his approach. It really makes sense that uh, states uh, have the primacy they do at the global level. By contrast, many other Rawlsians have said, look, it's inconsistent with Rawls's own approach if having the two moral powers gets you into the debate behind the veil of ignorance at the domestic level, uh, why doesn't that get you equal moral standing, equal moral consideration uh, at the global level? And uh, Rawls's own explicit answers to that have been sufficiently weak that Rawlsians who are unconvinced have really uh, rushed to uh, to press for uh, for a quite different conception uh, of global justice. Now, in your book, I will assure readers that you go through very systematically and consider all of Rawls's defenses of this approach, and then all conceivable additional. I mean, you're very Thomistic in this sense. You even come up with arguments he might not have thought of, and you respond to those in terms of, of, of this whole approach. But tell us, though, what are the dangers? Are there any dangers in the type of analysis Rawls is engaged in? I mean, in other words, is there a greater likelihood of an illiberal result when you treat people as peoples rather than as persons? Well, this has been one of the most uh, troubling features of Rawls's approach at the global level, um, because he has apparently been interested in making a move kind of like the one he makes at the domestic level and asking, in effect, what rules uh, could be framed that would ensure that as many different uh, participants would be willing to come on board with the global system he envisions. Uh, he's really operating, I think, often in a kind of lowest common denominator fashion. Uh, he's not willing to accept, as members in good standing of the global system, uh, you know, dictators and uh, warlike powers, but he's very much open to treating as legitimate uh, some fairly um, illiberal regimes, uh, regimes that might uh, embrace pretty constrained conceptions of human rights, uh, both economic uh, rights of the kinds that might be particularly interesting to libertarians, but also uh, just civil liberties of various sorts. And uh, so it's one thing to say that this might have some pragmatic value, right? We might have a more peaceful global order given a world of states uh, if we don't turn uh, various entities into pariahs. That might well be right. But what Rawls takes himself to be doing is framing uh, requirements of justice. And it really seems as if uh, by giving up on uh, treating uh, various uh, pretty important human rights as aspects of justice, um, He's uh, abandoned the, the really kind of inspiring quality of his project at the domestic level. Now let's shift to the part of the book that I think for most listeners will be the most interesting, which is the part in which you make a sustained argument that a system that perhaps uh, Rawls may not even have been aware of, I don't know if he knew about the work of Rothbard and work in that tradition, but you make a sustained argument that market anarchism seems to satisfy the requirements that Rawls lays down for a system of justice. That's right. And I want to be very clear that I'm uh, building here on the very interesting recent work of John Tomasi. Uh, Professor Tomasi, a philosopher and political scientist at Brown, argues in a book called Free Market Fairness that Rawlsian domestic justice can, with some fairly minor uh, adjustments be pushed in a strongly libertarian direction, uh, providing a bit more recognition uh, at the foundational level to property rights, and then acknowledging just how central market exchange is uh, to uh, enhancing people's well-being, uh, is arguably enough, Tomasi thinks, uh, to provide reason for Rawlsians to uh, opt for much more market-friendly uh, standards uh, of justice than Rawls himself does. What I suggest simply is that 
if we get rid of this notion that states ought to be treated as foundational at the global level and focus instead on particular persons uh, who are morally equal, whether whether or not, of course, they're they're uh, uh, equal in other respects, but they enjoy enjoy equal moral consideration. Once we suppose that that's true, not just at the domestic level but at the global level, then it seems as if we ought to be able to employ at the global level just the same uh, approach to understanding justice that uh, Rawlsians uh, would think would be justifiable uh, domestically. There's no difference. And if we can justify uh, an approach that is market-friendly at the domestic level, there's no reason then we can't do so globally. We can't see uh, market-friendly requirements as uh, uh, really applying across the globe. And so then the question is, can you push Tomasi's own approach in a, uh, an even more radical uh, direction? So uh, Tomasi wants to argue for a you know, kind of small government libertarianism as, uh, as consistent with these Rawlsian requirements. But I suggest that uh, if the basic idea is addressing uh, economic inequities and insecurities, uh, if that's the uh, the driving force behind the uh, uh, concern that leads John to uh, uh, take the view that really we still need a small government rather than uh, Rawls's big government, but perhaps still a government of some kind, I want to argue, no, market anarchy can, in fact, in uh, the genuinely unfettered uh, economic environment, produce uh, economic well-being that is remarkable, profound, uh, widely shared, uh, and uh, of a sort that ought to be enthusiastically embraced by those whose concern is not the existence of some redistributive state, but actually just the well-being of the economically vulnerable. I want to look at some of the arguments that you address in Part D of your final pre-conclusion chapter. Yes. And so one of them is, and I think this is the argument most people would be familiar with, because I think when people think of Rawls, they think not so much – the average person, maybe the average libertarian, thinks not so much of the law of equal what, – what is the – does he have a law for – is it a law of equal liberty? It seems like to me that sounds like John Stuart Mill. What, what's his law? Not not the the uh, difference principle. What's the other one? Right. So it, I mean, he talks about the basic liberties, the equal basic liberties. Okay, that right. So most of us think in terms of the other principle that he's talking about, which is the difference principle. And you argue here that even the difference principle can be more effectively secured and uh, robustly lived out I- under market anarchism. Now. With the difference principle, I want to make clear that everybody understands what that means. That, he, th- In other words, there is for Rawls a kind of a presumption of equality, that he, if we're behind the veil of ignorance, and I don't know if I'm going to be a man or a woman, or I'm going to be black or white, or rich or poor, or talented or untalented, I would want a society in which if I did wind up being totally untalented, and I wind up, wound up belonging to a despised group, that I would at least want a kind of equality so that even if I am in the worst position or roughly the worst position, it wouldn't be so bad because at least there'd be a rough equality. And then, of course, he has this caveat that says that, well, of course, if there's absolute equality, then people who are very talented won't bother sharing their talents with us because why bother? They just get an equal share. So we can have inequality, but that inequality has to be justified on the grounds that it helps the the less well off it makes the guy want to be a doctor and provide medical services to the poor so we can allow some inequality that basically is my understanding of the difference principle if i'm wrong i want you to correct me if i'm right i want you to explain how in a market anarchist system is that uh, ju- is that realized right so uh, i think that's uh, that certainly captures the the heart of what I take Rawls to be up to. Just a couple of uh, of qualifiers there before I talk about the market anarchist uh, response. So, uh, first of all, um, as I emphasized, uh, Rawls is interested in trying to articulate an account of justice uh, as inspiring solidarity, and so uh, he's not interested in uh, particularly in articulating a view that's going to be good for uh, perhaps what Marx would call the lumpen proletariat. He's not interested in uh, uh, just anyone and everyone at the bottom of the economic ladder. He's interested in people who are actually actively working. 
of the working poor, and he wants to ask what set of social arrangements would be needed for people in that group to stay invested in the society, to keep supporting its institutions, given that uh, they're not doing as well as other people. So it is important uh, that he's not interested in the absolutely worst person in the society as the one to whom justification has to be given, but to the, the group of people who are making a contribution to the society. Right, the okay. Bottom. Okay, so I think that's, that's one, one qualifier. And the other important qualifier is that he does think um, some of the time, uh, it's, it's not clear that he's consistent on this, on this front at all, but the, part of his official theory, at least, is that we have to satisfy the equal basic liberties first before we start asking these distributional questions. So there's a priority that's given uh, to this set of equal basic liberties uh, that we have to attend to uh, before we before we start uh, getting into the question of how distribution works. So the approach that I take uh, then, uh, which uh, is uh, one in which I happily build, as I say, on, on Tomasi's work, is to first of all note that we really could articulate some good reasons for including in that cluster of equal basic liberties uh, some protection for not just personal property, Rolf does think we need that because it safeguards of personal autonomy, but also productive property. That uh, productive property uh, rights uh, ought to be justified not just with respect to their contribution to uh, uh, increasing societal wealth and uh, thus the, the well-being of, uh, of the worst off, but also in particular uh, because uh, there are going to be reasons for treating those rights as basic. Um, as Tomasi notes, they're important to self-expression. Uh, and indeed, I argue that uh, really, as Rawls does in his earliest work, we ought to think about uh, not so much a kind of list, a narrowly justified list of basic liberties, but a presumption of liberty. Uh, it's Kind of ironic, actually, that in that early work, uh, Rawls talks about uh, uh, the maximal uh, possible set of basic liberties in a way that sounds very much, uh, ironically, like Herbert Spencer's law of equal li- law of equal freedom. And uh, H.L.A. Hart notes this in his review of Rawls. Rawls himself doesn't explicitly note the connection with Spencer, but it seems to me worth worth highlighting that uh, that there is this similarity. So I think you start out with a somewhat more expansive conception of bedrock liberty before you ever get into uh, the issue of distribution. But going on from there, then, it seems to me we can reasonably argue that um, an anarchist society, a society in which there's not the kind of top-down control that uh, might interfere with economic productivity and uh, people's ability to distribute uh, resources uh, through market processes, um, the absence of that kind of control frees up people uh, simultaneously to be immensely productive uh, in uh, ways that uh, vastly enhance uh, societal wealth and uh, creative in responding to a variety of social problems. Uh, we don't need, I think, institutions uh, of top-down control to respond sensitively and carefully uh, to the needs of the economically vulnerable and the economic uh, benefit that's yielded by you know, widespread unfettered market exchange uh, clearly can can spread uh, can spread throughout the society. And if we grant that uh, uh, the basic liberties constrain our ability to put in place some kind of mechanism of top-down control, and at the same time that market exchange generates enormous well-being uh, for those uh, at the bottom. And if we stress at the same time that the real economic losses suffered in our society by those at the bottom as a class, obviously individuals have different experiences, but uh, suffered uh, as a class, really result from state-secured privilege, then we can see that getting rid of state-secured privilege and freeing up the markets can have a dramatically positive effect. Uh, throughout the society that would give uh, people, including those in the working poor, enthusiastic reason to embrace uh, those market economic institutions. Uh, Gary, one more point I, I want to raise with you. This is also from Part D of your more or less final chapter. Of course, we all know that the state is non-consensual. Like, I think we can... You know, we're all adults here. I think we can dispense with the tacit consent, and you just happen to be standing there, so that proves that you like the state and you like its laws, whatever. I think we can just throw that out. But you say here, as one of the arguments you want to defend, non-consensual authority should be rejected 
in the original position, in Rawls' original position. I'd like you to elaborate on that, because that's good stuff. Yeah, sure. So we imagine ourselves uh, deliberating in the original position. We don't know what position uh, we're going to be in in the uh, the actual society, and so we're trying to frame rules that uh, we'll all uh, be willing to embrace. Um, it seems as if uh, we're going to have some reason, at any rate, uh, to be deeply suspicious of being subject to rules that we ourselves uh, don't uh, don't embrace and subject to authority structures uh, to which we don't consent. Uh, Rawls uh, wants to operate, I think, with a notion of um, not quite uh, tacit or hypothetical consent, but you know he seems to want to have the view uh, that we can be subjected to rules. Uh, to which uh, to which we would consent under the right circumstances, rules that we couldn't reasonably reject, um, and that's certainly better than subjecting us to rules uh, that uh, have no connection with our preferences and with our understanding. But it seems like uh, at least many of us are not going to want uh, to find ourselves uh, subjected to uh, arbitrary authority, and uh, we're going to want to build in safeguards. I certainly would want to do that. Uh, I think many of uh, many of your listeners would as well. And uh, that, I think, suggests that within the veil of ignorance, behind the veil of ignorance, uh, people are going to find themselves wanting to reject uh, uh, the kind of authority that real-world states actually exercise, that is, authority that's exercised without regard to the consent of the governed. Gary, you note in your book that uh, author royalties will be donated to antiwar.com, which you also said for the book we had you on for last time, uh, The Conscience of an Anarchist, of course, antiwar.com is a highly worthy recipient of your funds. I had Justin Raimondo on uh, a couple of weeks ago and told him that I think the only website that I make a recurring donation to is antiwar.com. We need it around even when there aren't so many hot wars going on and foreign policies on the back burner. We still need it, so that's a noble thing for you to do. Uh, is there anything you want to say that might wrap up the argument or, or give it some finality here, or are you satisfied with the presentation, or have I left any major component of it out? Well, I guess one thing I'd want to note uh, is that uh, that's directly related to this interest in, in antiwar.com, uh, just quickly, uh, is that the um, state-based approach that Rawls endorses uh, really, I think, makes it easier for him to be more war-friendly than he wants to be. So Rawls was not a militarist at all. Indeed, as a soldier during the Second World War, he was quite horrified to learn about the bombing of Hiroshima. And uh, he clearly wants to frame rules of international justice uh, in a way that uh, uh, will preclude uh, the kind of widespread uh, attacks on non-combatants that have uh, flouted just war norms and have been very much a part of uh, you know recent uh, recent international conflict, and yet at the same time, uh, he also seems to think that preserving uh, states, at least preserving liberal states, is so important that that could justify wholesale attacks on uh, non-combatants when no other option uh, turned out to be necessary. I think it's much harder to make that case. Uh, if you've got um, individuals at the bedrock of your uh, scheme of, of global justice, then if states uh, really are the, the basic actors there. Um, I, think, I think war is the worst thing the state does, and I think framing rules of international justice in ways that uh, undermine and may, the, the legitimacy of war make clear the illegitimacy of war uh, is about as important a thing as uh, a scheme of justice could do. So I think that's one way in which my proposed modification of all seems to be fairly important and, and worth highlighting. Well, Gary, I really appreciate your coming on today because this is an important topic for, I think, for everybody, but for libertarians in particular, we have to be careful that we're not just in a bubble, just reading each other, that we do engage with important figures out there, and you have done so in a non-polemical way. I mean, you don't spend the book saying, uh, John Rawls is a stupid head. Uh, to the contrary, you're very generous to him, and you, you know, you'll just say, well, his argument here is weak. You don't say this is the argument of a low IQ idiot. It's, there's nothing like that. I mean, this is a wonderfully refreshing thing to see. You have excellent blurbs from top scholars. The book is published by Paul Grave Macmillan. That's wonderful for you. So great. So keep on representing us and keep on being a good example of how somebody in a civilized way 
represents us before the broad scholarly community. Thanks for being here, Gary. Great to be on, Tom. All right, that's the program for today. I will have logistical details up very soon for my events next week, April 9th and 10th, at Florida Southern College and Liberty University, respectively. April 26th date at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. That will also be showing up soon. May 9th, all the details are there for that event in Provo, Utah. On my events page, which you'll find on my personal site, which is TomWoods.com, and the events page is TomWoods.com slash events. Make sure you're a subscriber of the program. You can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. We've got easy subscription links on the main page at TomWoodsRadio.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.